So basically the job description is reading and thinking. And so I'm, you know, I'm always reading, I'm always looking at different things and I'm always trying to just make sure that if I encounter something that doesn't make sense, that then I, you know, take a pause and, you know, at least look at what is going on. So, and you know, these anomalies show up in all kinds of places and it's hard to come up with a particular pattern, but sometimes you can be proactive to cause an anomaly to show up. So you have this is every week I, I have a subscription to value line and basically value line publishes every week, you know, this little list, they have like the stocks with the lowest PEs, stocks that have lost the most value in 13 weeks, stocks with the widest discount from price to book. They've got a few stocks with the highest dividend yields. So I just look at those lists every week and it doesn't take much time, probably less than five minutes a week or something, uh, just to see if there's anything there that pops out. And I remember many years ago, this might be more than 20 years ago, I noticed that there were uh, two funeral services companies that were showing a PE of two. And I had read an article a long, long time before that, which had said that uh, the, the gist of that article was that the lowest rate of business failure of any SIC code was funeral homes. So if you wanted to go into business with a high rate of business failure, you would open a bar to compete with Tiger Town. Okay. So if you open up next to Tiger Town, you might not do so well. You might be in and out of business in six months. If you open up a funeral home or you buy a funeral home, the odds that you would be in business even 50 years after that are really high. And the reasons are that nobody wants to go into funeral home business. You know, they want to go compete with Tiger Town, but nobody wants to open a funeral home. And basically it's in a way, recurring revenue, right? So if you have a funeral home in a community, generally families will want to go to the same place. And the other thing is that when your favorite uncle has passed away, you don't call six places trying to get the cheapest price on a casket. You know, that's not how you treat your uncle, your favorite uncle. You pretty much call the one place that you know is, you know, close and good and you accept pricing the way it is. You know, there's really no bargaining that goes on, if you will. And so that those are all characteristics of a great business. So I said, okay, you know, I know that funeral homes are a great business. Why are they selling at two times earnings? Because, you know, it's so stable. I mean, I don't know who is going to die in Peoria, Illinois next year, but I know how many are going to die, right? So it's a very stable business with very predictable cash flows. And it turned out, so I said, okay, we're going to dig into funeral homes to find out what's going on. And I uh, looked into these two that was trading at two times earning. And basically they had done a big roll up. They had a lot of debt. Even after looking at all of that, that two times earnings made no sense. And so after doing the work, I bought the stock and I was buying at $2 a share. And about a year later, it was $10 a share, you know, and uh, we were in and out in about a year or 18 months. So in that case, it showed up from value line, you know, so sometimes you find things in value line and sometimes we find things. Another place where uh, some of these things show up is 13F filings. So, you know, there's professional investors who have over 100 million invested in U.S. markets have to, every quarter, disclose what they own. And so you could look at the Berkshire Hathaway 13F, or you could look at Bill Ackman's 13F, or whatever investors you admire, you can look at their 13F and you can try to re -en reverse engineer why did they buy that stock, right? So why does Bill Ackman like Chipotle? Or why does he like the railroads? And... I mean, it's in, in many ways, it's investigative journalism, which is a lot of fun. So basically you go down a rabbit hole to try to figure out what was the reason. So sometimes when I see things on 13Fs, I'm not really interested in buying or selling or anything. I just want to understand why that particular individual did that. And when I figure out the reason why that person did that, then I can make a decision. Well, do I agree with that or disagree with that? Is it enough of an anomaly? What's going on? And then take it from there. So like, for example, if you looked at value line, or even if you look at some of the 13F filings, you will find that some national car dealerships in the United States trade at extremely low multiples currently. You know, in an overvalued market, car dealerships trade very cheap. And, you know, companies like AutoNation, Asbury, Lithia, and so on. And some of them are furiously buying back their shares. Like AutoNation has no dividend. It just buys back a lot of shares. Same with Asbury. And a car dealership 
is relatively easy to understand. Some of you might have even visited a car dealership or two. And uh, if you've seen the movie Fargo, you know, anyway, there's a scene in Fargo where this guy goes into a car dealership, used car dealership, and, you know, he's trying to buy a car. And you know how the sales guy says when you try to negotiate, he said, oh, you know, I got to go talk to my manager. And then he disappears to talk to the manager. And in Fargo, what happens is he goes over to the other office and they're discussing football scores or what happened that weekend. And then he comes back after five minutes. There's no discussion about any uh, things. And, you know, the back and forth is all a charade. So anyway, if you look at a car dealership, basically, it's three or four businesses in one, right? So there's the new car business. New cars are extremely easy to comparison shop for. And we have many websites like True Car and so on, which will help you understand the invoice price, et cetera. Car dealerships make almost no money on new cars because it's so competitive. People will know what they want to pay, know what options they want, et cetera. You know, it might be like, they might not even make $500 on a new car. So that business is like a loss leader, you know. But when you go buy the new car, they'll almost always get involved in financing it, either as a referral or whatever. And they do make more money on financing and insurance and so on, and warranties and all of that. Used cars, especially, you know, certified pre-driven, that has significant margins because you cannot do an apples to apples comparison, right? I mean, there's a, you know, red Honda Civic, which is, you know, with two years old at 10,000 miles, you really don't have another one that's exactly like that and so on. And especially if the dealer is a Honda dealer and giving you a Honda warranty on a used Honda, et cetera, you know, so, so used cars have better margins. And then the best margins are parts and service, right? And so if you look at a car dealership, parts and service is something like maybe 10 or 15% of the revenue, but it's almost 40% of the overall profits. It's extremely profitable because where are you going to go? They know they got you. They know that you got them when you come to buy a new car, but everything else, they got you. And in the US, the franchise laws are such that uh, the car manufacturers uh, are not allowed to sell cars directly. And also they really can't really shut you down or anything. So these are almost monopolies. Like if I have a BMW dealership in a certain area, a BMW is not going to put three dealerships within three miles. You know, this is not going to do that. So in that geography, you've got like a monopoly. So, you know, car dealerships are a great business, but then, you know, there's this looming threat of EVs, you know, where people think that there'll be a lot of EVs, which may not need a lot of parts and service. But the EV stuff is a little far out. And I think now, given what the three OEMs are doing, it might be even further out. And actually, between us girls, basically, if Tesla makes a 10% margin, then all the GM, Ford, and Stellantis will never make a dime on any EVs, you know, because their costs are going to be much more than 10% more than Tesla's. So they will want to delay, and they are delaying the transitions as long as possible. In fact, if they were smart, they would just run the business and run off, which is not invest in EV. Um, here's one of the anomalies to pay attention to. We have an anomaly called Elon Musk. And when you encounter someone like Elon Musk, there are a few things you do. The first thing you do is do not compete with Elon. It's not good for your health or your wealth. You know, So we have a anomaly there. And so if I was GM of Ford or Stellantis, I would just take my ball and go home. I would not play that game. And But what they're going to do is they're all going to play the game. They'll all lose a lot of money. And in the end, they will all cease to exist. And you heard it first here at Clemson. So that's just the way it is. But in the meantime, the car manufacturing is a terrible business. Car dealerships are a great business. And I think the market doesn't get it. So that's an, you know, a little bit of an anomaly. So that's kind of how we go about it.